In just a moment, we'll be turning to Daniel, the 10th chapter. I'll be talking this evening about the fight is real. And what I'm about to share with you, every single believer in this place, I know you need it because we're all struggling in this world. Would you agree with that? But the fight is real. There's a real spiritual fight that's going on. And we're going to be talking about that out of Daniel, the 10th chapter. One of the most interesting passages of Scripture where we're going to see, before our very eyes, we're going to see the demonic conflict with the angels. There is a battle between good and evil, between God and Satan, between angels and demons. One of my favorite pieces of Christian literature, and I don't read a lot of novels, etc., but it is called In This Present Darkness. How many have ever read that, This Present Darkness? You might be able to still find an old copy off of the web or Amazon or somewhere. But it is a story of a, a small town. It's written by Frank Peretti. It's a small town, and there's a little church there. But this whole area had been inundated by demons. And this church was just being assaulted, and the believers were being assaulted on a regular basis. So there came a pastor that came to that town and he knew how to pray. And as he prayed, it graphically describes, there we go, it graphically describes the conflict between angels and demons. Our next slide. Oh, oh is it following me? Okay, there we go. Good. I just need to know. So spiritual warfare, angels and demons, everything in our lives, look at this, when you are dealing with the, what you are dealing with in the natural realm, the struggles at your job, uh, interpersonal conflicts, difficulties that you may be facing, though they're not always caused by Satan or caused by God, there are always demons and angels involved in that. And you say, well, I, I just thought I was having a bad day. I just thought I was having a rough day. But there is an invisible world and an invisible fight, but just because it's invisible does not mean that it's very real to us. I'm going to back up to this slide. In 2 Kings chapter 6, this is portrayed for us with Elisha. The Syrian king wanted to attack Israel. But every time he decided to attack Israel, someone knew in advance where he was going to attack or how he was going to attack. And so he said, let's get to the root of this. Who is leaking this information? And then they found out that this information was coming from Elisha the prophet. And so he said, look, we're going to put a death warrant on Elisha. We're going to take him out. And this portrait that you see in front of you, here is Elisha in 2 Kings, the sixth chapter. And he may be studying, he may be praying, and he's with his servant. And the Syrian army, which we're still having problems with, amen, the Syrian army um, surrounded his household. That wouldn't be good to have an entire army of rogue soldiers are, um, come around your household. And the servant got all nervous because he says, Elisha, look out there, man. The Syrian army is coming to get us. He got all nervous. And Elisha said something like this, look, man, don't worry about it. And then he said a prayer. He said, Lord, open the eyes of my servant so he can see. And the Lord opened up the eyes of the ser serpent, the servant, <laughs> opened the eyes of the servant, 
and the servant saw what you see behind you, he saw chariots of fire. He saw the invisible world. He saw the angels of God. And this is one of my favorite statements in the Bible. Elisha says to the servant, in essence, you don't have to be worried because they that be with us, the good angels, are more than they that be with them. Do you realize every day in your family, in your home, at your work, in traffic, everywhere we're at, there are invisible forces, there are demon spirits, they are fallen angels, and I happen to believe that Satan assigns them to us. Ephesians chapter 6.10, we won't go through all that, but it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The conflicts you're having on a day-to-day basis, whether they're in your family or at your work or anywhere you're at, are a result of Satan messing with you. Do you understand that? Demons messing with you. Fallen angels. Well, you say, well, I have a hard time believing that, or I don't believe that. Well, listen, that's right where Satan wants you, not believing in demons and let, letting you think, oh, it's just a bad day. It's not just a bad day. Demons are coming after your family. You say, you're scaring me. I hope by the end you won't be scared. So just realize, though, but God also has angels and said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. So you thought it was just your boss or you thought it was just your mate or you thought it was just your kids. And it's not. It's an internal conflict, an eternal conflict that is going on between angels and demons. And the object of the demon is try to discourage you, dishearten you, break you down as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Can I ask you a personal question? How many would say, I have sensed the enemy coming after me like never before? Would you slip up a hand? Myself, my family. He attacks, he's been attacked, he's attacked my family, my children, my loved ones, my all people all around me. Attacks in the realm of health, attacks in the realm of relationship, finances. It just it happens. And I know that if it's happening with you and based on the conversations we all have with one another, I know that you're facing these things. But there's going to be some good news in a few minutes because I want you to turn to Daniel, the 10th chapter, if you're close enough up front and young enough, you can read the print. If not, you just see a bunch of blurry stuff. In Daniel chapter 10... Well, let me just proceed by telling you this. Daniel chapter 9 has one of the most phenomenal prophecies in all of Scripture. In our early Sunday school class, we studied it, verses 24 to 27. Do you know there's a prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that if you follow the Scripture and follow history and everything, it is a prophecy that talks about from the going forth to build the wall of Jerusalem. It gives a specific time and a historical place. And then it gives the amount of years before Messiah will be cut off. And if you do the math and figure that all out with 360 day days and everything, you'll come to the conclusion that Messiah, when it talks about Messiah being cut off, this exact day ended up being the final week of Jesus' life. Recently, there's a very popular evangelical leader that says, you know, we as Christians need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. I won't tell you his name, but very, very popular individual. And let me tell you this, you can't unhitch yourself from any part of the Bible because every bit of it is true. He said, well, a lot of that is unnecessary. Yeah, the the messianic prophecies, I think they're pretty important. Creation, I think that's pretty important. The history of Israel, that's pretty important. The Psalms and Proverbs, I think it's all important, don't you? So I did this. Instead of unhitching from the Old Testament, I just unhitched from him. 
It's a lot easier that way, isn't it? Well, you just go ahead on your sorry self. You believe that way because I don't want to be in anybody's shoes where they say a portion of the word of God is not necessary for your life. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. So here we are in Daniel 10, and one of the most phenomenal prophecies is Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And then in chapter 10, we're going to learn some things. We won't get into heavy prophecy tonight, but we're going to see the circumstances surrounding that, and you will be able to identify as a man or woman of God to say, man, I... I have a supernatural God, and he's willing to give me supernatural help because I have to battle these demons. I have to battle these forces that are coming against me. And in Daniel 11 and 12, Daniel 10 is just the preface. There's some of the most phenomenal prophecies regarding end times. So when Daniel would see a vision of the end times, He was seeing the days in which you and I live. In our earlier Revelation class, we were just talking about the fact that there's almost nowhere in the world where you can find a safe place anymore. You know that? Whether it's tsunamis or or typhoons in um, China or earthquakes in Japan or floods in North Carolina or fires in California, There's almost no safe place because this earth is groaning and travailing for redemption. So we start with the revelation, not the revelation like in the book of Revelation, but the revelation. Let me read the text. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. And we won't get technical about this, but some that don't believe that this is inspired scripture say, hey, um, Daniel didn't serve under Cyrus. Daniel served under Nebuchadnezzar. But that didn't mean he wasn't still alive under this period of time and probably advised Cyrus. Yet the Medes and the Persians followed the Babylonian Empire. It said this thing was revealed unto Daniel. Remember, Daniel's a prophet of God whose name was called Belteshazzar. Remember, they were given pagan names. Given pagan names, given pagan food, given pagan culture, but they could not change the heart of Daniel. Isn't that a good lesson for all of us? We live in a pagan culture, pagan everything all around us, but we have to keep our hearts true toward the true and the living God. So here's the revelation. It says, the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. He sees these prophecies that we read in chapters 11 and 12, and it says the time appointed was long. It was a long period of time. And also this idea of being long was it was a time of great warfare. Don't think just because we think, oh, our economy is doing so well and the stock market is racing so high and everything's wonderful here in Cinderella land. It's really not. Because globally, there are powers that be that want to destroy everybody. We know that, right? And so here it said there will be a time of great warfare and of great suffering. Just this past week, do you realize that in the tribulation, Russia will invade Israel? Do you know they have their eyes set on them? And there's a prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that you learned in the prophecy conference that Russia wants to come against Israel. But God supernaturally is going to come with fire out of heaven and nuke them Nobody comes against God and his people. Isn't that a wonderful thing? But here we have this going on in our days, but this is what Daniel had seen in the future. It said he understood the thing. Now, I don't think he understood the full ramifications. It just meant intellectually he understood the words of the vision that was given to him. 
It said he had understanding, at least intellectual understanding, of the vision. So here's the revelation that comes to Daniel the prophet. The recipient was Daniel. In those days, I, Daniel, let's just remember about Daniel. If you read the book of, the, of Daniel, the first, chick, first six chapters is all about his faithfulness to God all about him serving the Lord. He was the one that wouldn't let himself be defiled. God help us all to have that kind of spirit, a spirit like Daniel in these last days that said, I won't let my life be defiled. I won't let my mind be defiled. I won't let my heart be defiled. But it tells us in the context of this that Daniel was mourning and he was fasting for 21 days. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. These are days when some in the church, and when I say the church, I mean at large, it's, it's just one big celebration time. Oh, it's just so good to be happy in Jesus. But let me tell you this, these are not days of extreme happiness these are days of extreme pain. I don't know about you, but I know you as a believer have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit and you know he's in you, just say amen. amen. So you have the Holy Spirit in you. And I was sharing something out of Psalm 42 to the men the other day, and it's significant. I'm not much of a musician, but I know this. I know that if you take a guitar and you tune one string perfectly, and then you tune the next string next to it, let's say the last two strings on the guitar, and without putting your finger there, you pluck the one string, that other string will reverberate the sound of the string that you just plucked without plucking it. Do you know what God is doing in these days? Have you ever heard the song, Come Now, Fount of Every Blessing, right? He says, tune my heart to sing thy praise. In other words, when the world is going crazy, we want our hearts tuned to God's heart, don't you? And let me tell you something that I'm experiencing personally, and I'm no better than you. We have the same Holy Spirit. But right now, I'm sensing in the spiritual atmosphere that God is grieved with all that's going on. And if you're a person that loves God, see, you think, oh, if I'm a good Christian, every day is going to be happy and I'm going to be all full of joy all the time. Well, sometimes God wants you to know that God is hurt sometimes. You know that? He looks down on this earth and he sees the sin and he sees the suffering and he sees the injustices and God is hurt. And that's sometimes when you're in the presence of God and you think, oh, I'm waiting for a good feeling. And it's not a good feeling. You're feeling maybe sadness or sorrow or mourning. Maybe it's because the heart of God is mourning and he just wants you to feel his heart and you've tuned your heart to be connected with his. That's what happened with Daniel. So he's in this time of fasting. We have gone away from this lost art. Jesus told us in the... Um, Matthew 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount. When you fast, he assumed that we as believers would have times of fasting or that we would put away our food, we'd put away our pleasant things to focus on prayer and focus on him. But what happens when you fast? It's like a, it's like a physical detox, only it's a spiritual detox. And you will find that if you will fast... And you might want to just do your own study on fasting. We're not doing that tonight. You'll find that God will make your heart really tender. And God will place you in the realm where he can speak to you supernaturally and do supernatural things. There are other places in the Bible that when you're, when you're sick, it's time to fast. When you go through a time of suffering, it's time to fast. And God will work in your heart and speak to you. I'm going to show you the results in a minute. So we understand the recipient. So 
I want you and I want to be this kind of person that has my heart tuned to the heart of God so that God can speak to me. And I understand he speaks primarily through his word and by his spirit, but it can happen. You can, you can be tender toward God through fasting. He was the recipient. In verses 4 to 7, listen to this. Supernatural things will happen when you fast. You will have spiritual breakthroughs. You need to read Isaiah 58. It says that if you will fast, depression can be broken off of you. Oppression can be broken off you. Financial problems can be broken off you. Isaiah 58, because you have sought the Lord. But as Daniel seeks the Lord, one of the great blessings is God shows up. How many have a situation in your life where it'd be nice for God to show up? Amen. Amen. He is the righteous one. Listen to verses 4 to 7. Um, Our Pastor Johnson this morning talked about Revelation chapter 1. And this is so close. It says, so in the 4 and 20th day of the first month, that would be April or Nisan, As I was by the side of the great river. So he's been fasting for 21 days. And he's by the river Hiddekel. There's a little difference. Some think the great river was the Euphrates. Others think the Tigris was a great river. They were about 35 miles apart from each other. So it doesn't really matter. But in verse 5 he says, I lifted up mine eyes. So imagine you've been fasting You've been waiting for a breakthrough, and then God shows up. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girt about with the fine gold of Euphaz. His body was like the barrel, that little um, jewel that you see over there. It's like a clear kind of gold. His body was like the barrel and like in color to polished brass. The voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Daniel was the one for 21 days seeking the Lord. And if you will seek the Lord, see, in salvation, God seeks you But as a Christian, now your job is to seek God. He will visit you. And I'm not saying necessarily with an actual presence like this, but the presence of God will surely come. You may not see Jesus as the great high priest like Revelation 1, but there is no doubt in my mind that verses 4 to 7 are not talking about any ordinary angel. And I will make you this promise, that if there's some situation in your life or some need, and you have tried everything else, you need to try prayer. And you take prayer, and you mix it with fasting, and you've got like spiritual nitroglycerin. Because God looks down and says, you know what? That child of mine is not concerned about feasting right now like everybody else. They're fasting. If I ever see one of my children and my child um, looks sad, I go, what's wrong? Or my child says, I don't want to eat. Are you not feeling well? No, I'm going through this or that. Well, here, Jesus has shown up. I believe this is called a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But this is who Daniel sees, the righteous one, God revealed, God manifesting himself to us. 7b, a great quaking falls upon them. Remember when Saul um, saw the vision of the Lord on the road to Damascus? He was the only one that saw him. Nobody else saw him. So they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone. Sometimes God has to take us away from our friends, take us away from our fellowship, bring us into a situation. I don't know. I don't think he causes us to go to the hospital or 
wherever, but God just has you in a place where you at least feel like you're all alone, that's not always bad because that's a good place where you're not distracted from everything else and God can speak to you there. He said, I saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me. Occasionally, like on Christian television, you'll hear some person and they're going to give their testimony how they saw a vision of Jesus. You ever see these guys? And I was just so elated and everything was just so wonderful and everything smelled like heaven. You ever see these people? And I'm going, give us a break. Because if you saw the true and living God, the effect on you would be verse 8. It says, there remained no strength in me, no natural strength. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. Those two words are found in Isaiah 52 to describe Christ in his suffering when he said he had no form or comeliness. Remember those words? And he says, and my strength or strength was turned into corruption and I retain no strength. So you say, well, what are you, what are you saying by all this? Years back, I guess, I always thought that when Christ was near me or I was in his presence, that it would always be a good feeling or I'd feel wonderful or I'd feel happy or ecstatic or whatever. But sometimes a holy God meets us unholy people. And when that happens, you're, you're overwhelmed by how holy our God is. The results of the revelation and the manifestation of God are in 7b down to 9. Look at the ninth verse. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Two things here that are also very important. You're in a situation where you say, I don't know what to do, God. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to work. I don't know who to be. I don't know anything, God. And you will fast and you will pray. And if you will, God will show up with his word. In 2 Chronicles 21, when Jehoshaphat was surrounded by the enemy, he led the people. He said, let's just fast and let's just pray and then when they did that, there's a little Bible verse that says, you know what? He says, you're not going to need to fight in this battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. Wait for the word of God to hit your heart. And if you're seeking him, and maybe tonight it's this word. And you're saying, I need that for my soul. I need that for my spirit. But I didn't re realize that this problem I'm facing or what I'm going through is way bigger than I am. And so here, look at the last phrase, because he says, my face was toward the ground. There's a big deal out there now with the word worship. But the Greek word for worship is proskuneho, and it, what it actually means is I just prostrate myself before the ground. Sometimes I'll come across Christians that all they love to do is go to Christian concerts. Nothing wrong if you're going to be faithful to the Lord and go to Christian concerts. So I'm not knocking, so don't go there with me. But all I hear them do, they don't want to serve the Lord. They don't want to attend church and stuff. And they come up to me and I go, I'm going to such and such a worship concert, and I'm going to get my worship on. How many of you have ever heard people say that? You're not going to get your worship on because that's not worshiping. Just the fact whether I raise my hand or don't raise my hand, that's not my my worship begins right here, doesn't it? That's where it starts. And if you're in the presence of holy God, look at this. It'll drop you to the ground because we're finite men and finite women. But this is what we need. But guess what? We have some good news coming. Look at verse 10. Because as I showed you, first Jesus shows up. Isn't that great? How many would just love that? I would just love wherever you're at, whatever you're going through tomorrow at work, he shows up at your cubicle. That'd be nice. 
tell your boss, hey, I got to take a break. Somebody showed up here. Is that that guy? Yeah, that, I, I, I didn't see it, but anyway. But verse 10, look at this, the reaction. So, so the Lord shows up first. And then the Lord dispatches angels. Remember I told you there's a conflict between the angels and the demons? The reaction to this prayer and then the presence of the Lord shows up. Now God can send some angels. I want to use a southern word. It's called y'all, okay? Y'all better be thankful for angels, especially the way we live and drive and all that, right? How many thankful for some angels, aren't you? Only reason you're alive is because of the angels. But here it says, behold, that hand touched me. That This is not the one that is the glorified Christ, but a hand touched him. He's prostrate on the ground, and that hand somehow was, was delegated by a supernatural God which set him upon his knees. So he goes from prostrate on the ground to now he's up on his knees and upon the palm of his hands. And so I believe, and I hope you believe, that do you realize angels are messengers, right? So they can bring messages to us. But not only that, they must have the ability to touch us. Remember, touched by an angel. I don't know how much truth there is to all that stuff, but this one, I believe, in this touch. And you ever had a week where you said, I'll never be able to get through this. I'll never be able to get through this sickness or this pain and all. And then you prayed or others prayed for you. And then wholeness or healing came to you. And, and God somehow supernaturally touched you. And you were strengthened. He said unto me, O oh, Daniel, aren't you glad... Aren't you glad God knows your name? Amen? He knows you individually. Now, there might be a thousand people named Daniel or a million people named Daniel, but he knew his name because Daniel knew his God. And then the second thing is he says, a man greatly beloved. If there's any word we could give you tonight, it's number one, God knows you. Psalm 139, he knows everything about you. Secondly, he loves you. You say, well, that's a very simple concept. Don't you have anything deeper to tell me tonight? Well, there's nothing better I could tell you than God could love a person like us. I spent most of my Christian life wondering how come God loves me. I'm going to ask him that one day. How come you love me? And he'll say, I just do. I always ask Nita, I say, Nita, after 40 years, everybody say, that's a long time. After 40 years, I will say to her, and I'm just looking for love in all the wrong places, all the right places. And I say to her, Nita, do you love me? And you know what she'll say to me? Don't, don't ask me stupid questions. That's just not a stupid question. She said, all these years, you don't know that by now. But God does love you. And he says, and understand the words that I speak unto thee. So this is an angel that's been sent to him. And he says, stand upright. Now, when you're in a lot of pain or you're in a lot of suffering, I have found that God babies you for a while. Everybody in here like to be babied? Nobody likes to baby anybody, but we all like to be babied. But there will come a time when God says to you, all right. You've cried your heart out, but now it's time to stand up, right? We use the term, I don't know if it's this crew, but put the big boy pants on. You ever heard that one? Okay. So he says, stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. Well, David's, not David, Daniel's thinking, well, I've been calling on you for 21 days. Where have you been? He says, I'm now sent. When he had spoken the word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, now this is also a word for you, fear not. Because Satan is a master terrifier. Do you know that? 
He will cause pain in your body or difficult circumstances to make you afraid. And fear will paralyze your soul. So the greatest thing a man or woman of faith can do is say, I refuse to walk in fear. I will walk by faith, not by sight. And so the reaction to the touch of God, the love of God, the words of God, and the commands of God to stand upright is found here. Listen to this. And from the first day, the doubt has set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God. Thy words were heard. This is also important to understand. You say, man, I've been praying about this situation for a long time. I've been praying for my healing. I've been praying for a financial reserve reversal or whatever it is. And I'm here to tell you, please do not give up. Do not stop. Do not quit praying because that answer might be on the way. I know it's on the way because he said your words were heard. 21 days ago, your words were heard. Do you think that when you pray, God hears your words instantaneously? I do. But sometimes there's some time lapse between the time that you pray and the time that your prayer is answered. And let's look at two things quickly. There's resistance in the spirit world. Why should we stay at it in our prayers? Because reinforcements, that's our angels. You're being attacked by the enemy, but reinforcements are going to come through prayer. And listen what the angel says. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, that was a demon spirit assigned to a geographical area. And you know what I believe? That prince of the kingdom of Persia is still over there working, right? He's still stirring all that stuff in the world. It said he withstood me one in 20 days. So up in the upper atmosphere, here's this angel been dispatched to answer the prayer of Daniel. But there's a demon that comes, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, and he heads him off. And they're having a wrestling match, as it were, for 21 days. And this angel, I'm going to skip a few of the verses, but I'm, he, this angel is getting weary or can't handle him. And then God says, hey, we need some more superpower. So he says, hey, Michael, I need you to go down and take care of that business. And as Michael went down, he wrestled with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And then the angel was free to go down and minister to Daniel. So if you ever wondered, is this all there is, just what I see in the natural world? The answer is no. There's all kind of cool stuff happening. You see that? And if you will pray and you will prevail, supernatural things will happen in your life. Let's jump to close with this. The reassurance. Let's go here. God has already told him he loves him. When God says something one time, he means it. In the word of God, there's something called the law of double reference. When God says something more than once, he really, really means it. And you know what he says? He says, I love you. O oh, man, greatly beloved. Now here are just four or five statements which we could develop, but we won't. He's reassuring Daniel that he's loved. He's in the middle of a tornado of conflict and he's being told by this angel that he's loved. And then he's telling him, don't be afraid. And we're telling you that tonight. And God is telling you that. Don't be afraid. You will make it through. Peace be unto you. Be strong. And he says it again. Be strong. And when he's spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. There's more to give you, but that's the a reassurance that God will come through for you. Let's bow for prayer tonight. Lord, I pray that this information from the word of God would be enlightening 
to our hearts and to our minds. Maybe there are a lot of believers here that either did not know these things about this celestial conflict that affects us down here on this earth, but it's a real battle and a real war. And you told us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So this week, strengthen yourself in the Lord. If you've not been praying faithfully, be a man or woman of prayer. If you've gotten away from the word of God, get back to the word of God. If you've not been fighting and standing strong for Jesus, get back in the fight. If you've not been sharing your faith, do that again. Everybody in this room has been affected by what the enemy has tried to do to you. But tonight, I want you to be able to say, I will not be defeated. And if you receive this word, I want you to just say out loud with me tonight, I will not be defeated. Say it with me. Say with me, I will not give up. I will remain faithful. And Jesus will come through for me. Father, touch lives today. Thank you and bless you for your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, we all say amen. How many thankful you're a Christian?